Cool. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Keep Calm and Fasten Your Seatbelts. So I'm Sonia. Uh, I wear dark hoodies, so I'm a legit security engineer, obviously. <laughs> um, so I wanted to start this talk by defining what is uh, cybersecurity and why is it important. So cybersecurity is the techniques of protecting computers, network, uh, programs, and data from unauthorized access or attacks that are aimed for exploitation. So you might have remembered in October 2016 that there was a series of DDoS attacks that were launched against uh, DNS servers, and you had those web services that were actually down. So GitHub, um, PayPal, Spotify, Twitter, and you have something like this. You might be familiar uh, if you're using GitHub, the pink unicorn. <laughs> so how, how is it happening? So who here is familiar with or heard about Shodan? Okay, a couple. Uh, so basically, Shodan is like the Google for IoT, uh, any devices connected to the, uh, the internet. So what I've done here, uh, at the, uh, in the uh, search input, I've uh, put the, uh, the word webcam, and it gives me a list of all the webcam uh, connected uh, and open. Um, and I had a little look through, and this is where you could find, actually. Uh, I've redacted, obviously, the, uh, the IP address, but this is what's happening somewhere in Canada with a webcam. <laughs> uh, so how does DDoS actually work? So usually you have the attacker, they'll uh, go through um, those sort of websites and because they're not, they're not changing their uh, credentials, they're using the default credentials, um, so they will actually um, use all the, uh, those devices, um, change it into bots, and then attack the, um, the web servers. So this is when you have uh, exhaustion exhausted the, uh, the resources for GitHub and you will get the, uh, the pink unicorn. This is another example of cyber attack, ransomware. You might be familiar, you've seen it on the, on the news. This one is for uh, the WannaCry ransomware. So basically, the attacker will send a phishing email. The user will receive the, uh, the email, will click on the link. Uh, on the background, there will be a malware that will impact and execute within the, uh, the machine. Um, they might also have different, uh, they'll try to pivot to different uh, network and start doing stuff on the, uh, the device and obviously it will encrypt the, uh, the data and the attacker would like to have Bitcoin in exchange <laughs> to get your data decrypted. So for WannaCry, the impact was 130 countries were actually impacted by this, uh, this ransomware. It was one of the biggest ransomware uh, attack in history. And usually the attacker uh, follows this, uh, this kind of uh, methodology, which is called the cyber kill chain. So the attacker will start by doing some reconnaissance, so they'll do a little bit of, um, they will research uh, some information on the internet, what is a public, publicly uh, knowledge. Um, then they will uh, weaponize, which means that they will create a payload to attack their, uh, their target, they will deliver it. Uh, then uh, you'll have something like command and control, which means that they will uh, shift like pivot, uh, move to a different network. Uh, and then if it's in, the, um, for a ransomware, for example, it will encrypt your, uh, your data. So this is the, uh, I'm not gonna go into all the technicalities for uh, ransomware, but basically the, uh, the group uh, was called uh, Shadow Brokers, uh, stole in some uh, uh, tools that the NSA actually developed uh, and were using, um, um, a vulnerability on Windows to actually, through the port uh, 445, uh, to send it to get a remote, uh, remote control uh, execution. Uh, once they were within this, uh, the machine, uh, so they started actually uh, killing processes, encrypted the, uh, the data, uh, and have this uh, ransomware message. This is another example of a cyber attack. It's called sextortion. Or basically the porn scam email. Uh, so uh, the blurred bit is actually the, uh, the password of the, uh, the user. Uh, and also, usually phishing email works on emergency, fear, uh, just to push you to actually do an action in that case, because you don't want your family to know that you've done, you're, you are going out to a porn website, doing stuff in front of your <laughs> computer. Uh, you should pay to this uh, Bitcoin address. What I would recommend is just copy paste, well this is a scam obviously, but if you're curious, uh, copy paste that Bitcoin address and you can actually check uh, if the, uh, the wallet exists. In that case you can see that it was just an empty wallet, so it's a scam. Another way to understand how this might happen, you have website like Have I Been Pwned? So you can put your email address and see 
which company actually um, um, leaks your information through your database, uh, data bridge, sorry. So this is just an example of all the companies that suffer uh, data breaches, and it's only a small portion actually, but you might recognize a lot of them, <laughs> unfortunately. So how data breaches occur? So usually, uh, in that case, let's say it's a researcher, not an attacker, uh, it will try to perform social engineering or to try to look for weaknesses within your infrastructure, on your application. Once they have an attack uh, entry, an attack point, they will try to exfiltrate the data, and this is, and then they will dump it. It could be on the dark, uh, dark web or anywhere where they can actually resell your data, because data is how they do money. And this is like usually the next day you will have those headlines. Uh, yeah, the the example, the list is is long on that. So this was just to give you uh, some example of cyber uh, security attacks. Let's move to web application security uh, attacks. So the first example is the Trump Donation website incident. I don't know if any of you heard about what happened. But basically a couple of years back uh, during uh, the presiden presidential uh, campaign, the Trump camp did something stupid. How surprising. <laughs> Uh, so one of their developers embedded uh, this piece of code uh, within their uh, campaign website. Uh, so you can tell, okay, that's just a JavaScript script. What can go wrong? Well, actually this tag was in the source codes and it was pulling the script directly from a developer GitHub repository for the project. This is the developer, Igor Escobar, who's the maintainer of uh, jQuery mask plugin. So basically, you can submit a PR to inject arbitrary JavaScript code into Donald Trump's websites. <laughs> this was uh, Trump websites uh, at that time. So if you're looking at the source code, you could see that within the script, you can also find Igor Escobar uh, script. So this page is loading a JavaScript directly from the page hosted on um, a GitHub page. And basically, if the file on GitHub gets modified because it's open source, then the changes will be reflected on Trump's website immediately, like under 30 seconds. <laughs> so imagine what you could do. So uh, first of all, the repository was a jQuery mask plugin, so it was used to enhance the user experience uh, when sub submitting a form. So this was the, uh, the legit jQuery mask uh, plugin. So anyone can submit a PR, as I said. So if Igor, the maintainer, accepts the PR, then your JavaScript code, whatever it contains, will get injected to Trump's campaign donation website immediately. So what could you do if you're an attacker? Uh, you can modify the DOM, you can redirect the user, uh, you can add a keylogger, you can go insane, it's just wild with. But we're talking about Trump's website. What about redirecting all the people to Clinton's website? <laughs> Um, so yeah, this is just a demo. Uh, obviously, it's not going to be on the uh, on the website, but you can try on the uh, on the Dev console. So for those who uh, are not familiar, it's basically to tell the URL to if it's secure Donald Trump website to go to Hillary Clinton website. So this is actually the the example to uh, raise a pull request. So this is the uh, the plugin, and why not adding this little snippet of code and just raise the PR? Uh, obviously, the researcher didn't do it, but it was just to troll Trump. <laughs> but you can see how easy it is. So the security hole was fixed within uh, three hours. There was no actual damage uh, that was done, besides bad PR for the Trump campaign. Yeah. Another good example is the uh, crypto miner incident. Well, there's a lot of crypto miner incidents, we might say, but this one is the... Um, actually targeted a lot of uh, websites. So you could see the ICO, United States Courts, uh, General Medical Council, Manchester City Council, uh, even through um, uh, Australia as well. So the script was uh, coinhive.com, you can see at the top the request URL. And um, on Twitter you can see, so Scott Helm is one of the um, famous researcher, um, security researcher. He said that more than 4,000 websites were actually uh, targeted by this, or a, a victim. So it wasn't the sites, actually, that were, they've been compromised. It's rather a script they had a dependency on. So that dependency was coming from a company called TextHelp. Uh, and TextHelp basically is doing, so this is the website from TextHelp, they're doing, doing assistive technologies, and one of their products is called Browse Allowed. 
So browser love is, yeah, is for um, doing accessibility, which is good for companies. So you can see that it's easy, as easy as taking, copying this script and just putting it on your code base. So we're back to the Trump problem, except this time it's real. It targeted 4,000 websites plus. So let's take the, uh, the script. So this was the script. Uh, you can see ba.js. Uh, so this is a copy from uh, bin paste. You can see the, um, the gibberish code at the top. That was the, uh, that was the payload uh, in, that was including the, uh, the crypto miner. If we deobfuscate the, uh, the code, you could see, you don't need to be a genius to understand this, it's just you can see the last like CPU config and the miner start, it will, it will start the crypto miner on your website. So basically, uh, it will also slow down the, uh, the website, it will have an impact for the, uh, the customers. So apparently CoinHive is a legitimate service to monetize your business with your user CPU power. They didn't appear to have any involvement from them in this case. But what happened is the attacker managed to gain access to the storage uh, where the file was compromised um, on Browsela, well, text help. The files get distributed from the CDN and now every website calling this script will have the crypto miner embedded within their code base. The last example is the event stream NPM package incident. You might have heard of it or experienced at your, uh, at your organizations. So two years ago, there was a malicious package uh, flat map uh, stream that was published to the NPM registry and it was added as a dependency to the widely used event stream package by the attacker write 9 control So they had 8 million downloads later Application all over the web were running malicious code in production. Yay <laughs> So what is the event stream? So it's a toolkit um, They're uh, used for the in the JavaScript ecosystem that uh, that is um, that creates and manage uh, streams It has been authored by Dominic Tarr so as you can see, Dominic Tarr is quite a busy maintainer. He, he has over 400 packages, so you can think he doesn't have time to maintain all the packages. So obviously he's working with uh, other maintainers. So that's the, um, the profile from GitHub from Dominic Tarr. Uh, from the timeline, you can see that the event stream package uh, was created in 2011 and the attack was actually performed in uh, seven years later. So how does this happen? So basically in July 2015, uh, a user called Devius uh, asked if they uh, he could add a flat map functionality. The interesting thing here is the attacker actually did a little bit of social engineering on the developers. So you know for open source usually um, you have a lot of issues or threads where developers can uh, communicate and ask if um, a module can be added or merged and everything. So basically the attacker went through all the threads and see that piece of information, if you publish this module, then make a pull request to include it, I will merge it. That's like actually a good entry point for any attacker. So basically, three years, um, in August 2018, um, a user called Antonio Macias, uh, who's the uh, developer, published a non-malicious package, uh, that package flat map uh, stream. After that, Ryan Knight Control came in and say, Oh, Dominic, don't worry. I'll make sure to implement this package within the code base. You don't need to do anything. I'll do it. Uh, and he, he was continuing this social engineering process. Uh, so Dominic was like, okay, it's, he's building this, this trust. And he gave him actually the full NPM publishing rights for this module on the NPM uh, ecosystem. So what right Nine Control did was um, doing pushing some cosmetic changes and at the end, he actually uh, launched the, uh, the attack. Um, and he pushed his malicious code. So then we started seeing issues. Uh, the, the people that were downloading these packages, so um, the website was uh, slowing down. So there's like issues from Nodemon saying, what's going on? Well, everything is so, so slow now. You had, is there any backdoors of dependency? What's going on? So the target was Copay, a Bitcoin wallet. Not surprising, if it's not cryptocurrency, it's Bitcoin. Uh, so uh, this was the website before it was, uh, was pulled out from um, the internet. So the strategy was actually to be executed when the copy app uh, was being built. They succeeded for uh, a couple of versions. Uh, the uh, event stream repo has been archived. This was the, um, uh, the profile from uh, right Nine Control. It has been pulled out as well from, uh, from GitHub. Uh, and usually when you push a commit, you have to, well, 
When you upgrade dependency you, as a commit, you can say like update dependencies, but some were really fed up with what happened and this is what their commit they've put. <laughs> Shared love. Cool. So now I'm going to move to uh, what is web, security, web app security. So to define web app security is a branch of InfoSec that deals specifically with security of websites, web app, and web services. Uh, who here is familiar with OWASP? Cool. Uh, so basically OWASP uh, stands for Open Web App uh, Security Project and it's a community de dedicated to uh, educate developers around uh, security. So they have their own websites. Uh, they also produce a lot of um, good guides, guidelines around everything, IoT, mobile, uh, applications, name it, you will find. And everything is free. Uh, I think one of the most important or the well-known one, their flagship is the always top 10, that has the 10 most critical web app security risks. So basically, and this is back to the example that I've mentioned earlier, um, <clears throat> The application security risk would be that a threat agent would find any attack vectors to bypass the security uh, controls, uh, and then um, it might be like steal all the data, and you have a business impact. So it could be reputational, financial, anyway. Uh, this is just to show you the, the changes, because usually always for the top 10, they issue a new version every three, four years. Uh, so the latest is 2017, but we're gonna talk about using components with known vulnerabilities. Um, so, how do you know if your application is vulnerable? Who here knows all the versions, all, all the components that you're using? I'm not talking about React or the mainstream one. No. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, if you don't know the versions of your uh, components that you're using, if you don't scan for vulnerabilities regularly, uh, if you don't fix or update uh, the, the platform. How you can prevent it? Well, you can remove the unused dependencies. You can inventory uh, both client-side and server-side. Um, and you can also prefer, uh, obtain components from official sources. So when you type the name of the component, be careful because sometimes a type of squatting can let you download malicious packages. Um, yeah, and there's also a website that actually lists all the common vulnerabilities and exposures. This is just an example with uh, React. But I'll show you a couple of tools that will help you actually uh, give you the visibility um, and list all your packages. So who here is familiar with the GitHub dependency graph and depend the bots in general? Cool, so the dependency graph basically will go through all of this, uh, the file depending on the, the language, will scan, it'll let you know if you have any vulnerable package. Um, so if you want to set it up, you have to go to your repo, go to insights, dependency graph, and allow access, this is for private. By default, it's enabled for uh, public repositories. Uh, you can also set the, uh, the settings, uh, how you want to receive the security alerts. Uh, so by emails, you will receive a nice message from GitHub. <laughs> Um, but disclaimer, they don't, they say they don't, they don't catch all vulnerabilities because it's a free tool. Uh, so that's a good start if you want to have visibility on your packages. Another one, and uh, this one has been acquired by GitHub is Dependabot. So if you don't want to look for um, the version that you have to upgrade to, Dependabot will do it for you. For you. So basically, uh, oh, by the way, who knows that GitHub has, has a marketplace where you can add, uh, get applications. So Dependabot is available on the, their marketplace. It's free for private, uh, public, and, and private. So um, yeah, and you, you can go to the security tab and create automated uh, security fix. So basically Dependabot will raise an automated pull request telling you to which um, version you have to, uh, to upgrade your vulnerable packages. Uh, they also have a Slack integration, and they have that cool feature called compatibility score. So basically they will compare uh, against other open source projects, and if it doesn't break their CI/CD pipeline, uh, they will bump the score up. Uh, you can also uh, configure it through a YAML file, so if you want all, only to focus on security uh, vulnerability or only on production, you don't want to target your dev dependency, you can do all of this with uh, through the YAML file. You can also validate your YAML file. Uh, and if you don't feel adventurous, you, you can also do it through their online platform so you don't have any excuses for not doing it. Um, I would suggest for security alerts to set up a distribution list so all of the developer that are working on uh, the repo are aware of what's going on for those security alerts. Another tool maybe you might be familiar with is Sneak. It's doing the same thing that the uh, dependency graph uh, and Dependabot. It will raise, well, it will continuously monitor your dependency and raise automated uh, PR, oh, issues, 
Snake also is available on the GitHub Marketplace. Um, it's free for open source, and I think it's free for small organizations. Uh, and they also have an online platform where they will list all the vulnerable packages that you have for your project, and they will give you information uh, and remediation, obviously. Uh, they have uh, Slack integration as well. Uh, if you're wondering how does this work with the Slack integration, usually when you go to, on the platform, uh, you'll have just the, uh, the integration tab, uh, a Slack integration, and you can do it through webhooks for a snake. Uh, you can also have an integration through GitHub. So when you scroll down at the bottom of your pull request, you can have a step, uh, and you can also make the, the build fail if you think you have to fix the, uh, the vulnerability before pushing live. Uh, and Snake also will send you uh, an email if there's any uh, vulnerability. Uh, going back to the GitHub Marketplace, just, just to give you an example of all the application actions that GitHub um, provide with dependency management, and with security. So there's a lot of tools that you can try, especially if you're working on open source. Uh, so that's a good, a good way to experiment with those tools. Um, so now let's move to uh, features that can actually protect you from uh, the, for example, the Donald Trump uh, incident. So who here is familiar with the content security policy? I've heard about it. Uh, so the CSP is actually an added layer of security that helps to uh, prevent uh, any injection attack. So basically, you'll whitelist your assets per page. Uh, and if it's not in the list, the browser won't load it. So it's an added layer of security. You have really good documentation on MDN on the, on the topic. There's also a specific website called contentsecuritypolicy.org, if I remember correctly. Uh, they will give you a list of all the directives for every type of assets. Should it be uh, fonts, images, scripts, uh, and the value that you have to, uh, to apply to, uh, to those. They will also give you example for the uh, content security policy. Um, a good thing uh, at first, if you're too scared to implement uh, a CSP because it might break your website, is to do report only and have report your eye as your endpoint to collect all of those errors uh, and let you fine tune your CSP before pushing it live. Another good uh, um, security layer is the server source integrity. Who here heard about the SRI? Okay. So it's another security feature that enables the, the browsers to verify the resources they're fetching are delivered without being tempered. So basically, you might be familiar with those, if it's regardless if it's jQuery, Bootstrap, or any uh, packages that you might be fetching. There's these uh, options with copy the script tag with the SRI. So basically, this is what you would see if you copy-paste this integrity uh, checksum. This is the SRI they'll actually uh, prove that the data hasn't been tempered. Uh, if you don't have it, or if you want to add it to your in-house script, you can use the SR hash generator. They will generate a hash for, uh, for you. And also the coverage is quite good, it's like 90%. Uh, same, there's really good documentation on MDN on their super source integrity. Uh, more tools, online scan, they're free. Um, who here knows about web hints? Do you know the, do you remember the name it was called before web hints? Tricky question. <laughs> it was called Sonar Whale. That's, you can see the little uh, uh, logo. So basically, you'll take the URL of your organization um, and it will scan for you and give you um, indications around accessibility, uh, compatibility, performance, and also security. The good thing with this website, usually when you have those kind of tools, they will just scan and give you the issues without really explaining what's wrong and how you can remake it. Uh, so here, they actually, for each of the security issues, they will give you why is it important and how you can fix it. As also, you might be familiar with uh, Lighthouse, where you can run an audit through the uh, Dev Console. You have just to go to Audit and just run, click the button, run audits. Uh, and there's, um, so this one, there's a bit, um, because SNCC is directly implemented or, uh, within uh, Lighthouse, so they will let you know which um, packages are vulnerable. Uh, you can also use, use uh, page speed insights or app trends. So you might be saying, um, Sonia, why are you speaking about, uh, talking about performances? What is, what's the relationship with uh, security? So basically, you can't go to your product manager and saying, we want to implement a CSP, they'll say, yeah, what's the, 
what's the value? What you could say is, well, by doing a CSP, you'll have to do a little bit of cleanup for each pages by reducing the number of requests. So obviously the performance will be better for, and the user experience will be better. So just to shift the, uh, your point of view. Uh, so this is why those kind of metrics are important and this is something that you can bring to your business. Uh, there's also other like AppGuard, uh, Qualys SSL. Uh, this is more to check your headers or your cookies if they're um, correctly set. So what's next? Uh, if you're interested in security, but you don't really want to jump into the security uh, department, you can become a security champion. Uh, so maybe your uh, company has a security champion program. So basically a security champion is a developer which will act, who will act as the bridge between security and the developer team. Because so, usually in your uh, company, security team might be a small group, I don't know, like two, five. They don't have time to go to all the agile methodologies, like all the sprint planning um, and everything. So this is a good way for a developer as well to uh, be more familiar with uh, security. Um, so if you have a program, if your company have a program, just, yeah, try, might be a good. Uh, and by the way, this one, the security champion playbook, this is part of the OWASP, so you can find this playbook on the OWASP website. Uh, I would recommend, uh, before closing, the, those uh, reads. So there's the sneak report they're doing every year, the state of open source uh, security report. There's actually an updated one from Sonatype, the state of software supply chain. And they will give metrics not only around the JavaScript ecosystem, but also with Java and the other programming languages. There's a really interesting postmortem uh, blog on the sneak website on the uh, NPM event stream that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and also Troy Hunt, an Australian security researcher, is really interesting, a blog post around the CSP, uh, open source security, and all of those. Uh, if you're interested in uh, also security, I've wrote a um, medium piece around how did I become a security engineer, and I try to gather a lot of resources. So if you're a junior or you want to um, join the, uh, the industry, uh, this is a good read. Also, uh, this is just shameless. <laughs> uh, so I'm doing this uh, initiative around women in cybersecurity. So if it happens that you work in security, uh, reach out to me. I'll make sure to add you on the list. What I want is to give more uh, highlights on the diversity and inclusivity for uh, women in cybersecurity worldwide. Uh, I would also recommend those um, meetups. So Ladies of London Hacking Society, OWASP Women in AppSec, and OWASP London Chapter. Don't be afraid, it's, friend, it's developer friendly. <laughs> uh, the one for Ladies of London Hacking Society is really, um, if you're more interested on the technical side, like hands-on with labs, uh, this is a good place to, uh, to go. Um, and yeah, I'll just finish by saying my, my motto, get secure, be secure, and stay secure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sonia. Okay, so uh, we do have a question for you. Um, what's the best way to move into security if I already have a few years of experience as a backend developer? Um, well, first of all, I would say that the uh, security industry is quite large. So if you're interested in breaking stuff, I would say the, um, uh, the resources that Celine uh, spoke about with Hack the Box and the, uh, the Bug Bounty programs, that's a good starting point to see if you really are interested uh, in security. And you can try the Security Champion program um, if you have one in your company or just approach your security team and say, well, I would like to be a security champion, so let's have a chat. And this could actually move to another like, internally uh, to security career. Cool. Okay, we just had another one pop up. How do we protect IoT devices we buy from being hacked if the manufacturers won't give us access? Sorry. sorry. I can repeat that. Sorry, it moved while I was speaking. <laughs> <laughs> How do we protect IoT devices we buy from being hacked if the manufacturers won't give us access? That's a tricky one. You can't actually. If they don't allow you to change the uh, default credentials, that, that's a big issue. You can't really do anything uh, on that. Uh, I mean, on changing the credentials. Um, what I would say is probably do some security, um, network security. So probably like segregate the, the network to have this, uh, this device properly seg segregated from your other network. Uh, yeah. Cool. Um, nothing else has popped up. <laughs>